Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at the last Degturev machine gun. This is the RPD, uh, Degturev's lightweight machine gun in 7.62 by 39 millimeter, aka the M43 cartridge, which went into development in 1943. This was during World War II. The Russians recognized that their full power rifle cartridge, 762 by 54 rimmed, was really more powerful than it needed to be. And some might say, well what's the problem with being too powerful? That's kind of a good thing, right? Well, the problem is it puts, it means extra weight in all the guns, it means extra recoil in all the guns, things become easier to carry and easier to shoot if they're using less powerful ammunition. And so that was the motivation behind the Soviet development of the M43 cartridge. They did some testing and they found that accuracy and terminal effectiveness were really quite acceptable out to like 800 meters, and they weren't doing that much shooting, especially at like the infantry squad level, even out that far. Most of their shooting was much closer. So the Soviet Union put into practice a plan to come up with a new a whole new family of small arms for the 762 by 39 millimeter cartridge at the end of World War II, and this would involve a rifle, a submachine gun, and a light machine gun. Now the submachine gun was the AK. It was, as originally issued, it was for special troops, paratroopers, armored, you know, uh, mobile infantry, but not for the average standard line infantryman. Um, it was treated like a submachine gun. The infantrymen got SKS rifles, and the squad support machine gun was this. So uh, trials began, uh, development of this gun began still during World War II. Uh, prototypes were submitted, designs were submitted by kind of all the major Soviet uh, design bureaus. Degturev, of course, proposed a design, a couple designs. Sudeyev did. Um, uh, who else? Spagen, I believe, uh, put in a design. At any rate, Degturev's design was chosen. Um, initially there wasn't a, a dictate for mag magazine versus belt feed, uh, but they wanted a, you know, support weapon capable of sustained fire. Now the sustained fire thing is a little, requires a little clarification, because the intention was for this to be used in short bursts, not in heavy suppressive fire. And one of the things that Degturev did was he designed this gun with a fixed barrel. It does not have a quick change barrel. The idea being you shouldn't be shooting it so much that you have to replace the barrel. And if we can avoid having a replaceable barrel, then we can simplify and lighten the whole gun. And ultimately, with a 300 pound or 300 round combat loadout of ammunition, the RPD came in at like right at half the weight of a DP-27 light machine gun with an equivalent um, load of ammunition. And 300 rounds was the combat load for a gunner. So they were able to massively lighten the gun without losing essentially any effectiveness. So that was the purpose behind the RPD. So let's pull it apart, take a look at how it works, and some of the details of this drum, because this is actually a belt-fed gun that has a drum holder with it. Um, and yeah, take a look. Before we take a look at the gun itself, I want to start with the ammunition. So what we have here is, is a belt-fed gun, and uh, the Soviets developed a 50 round belt. This is the second half. You would take two of these belts and link them together. So here is our first half with a starter tab, and then at the end of the belt you have a tab like this that can go into the beginning of the second half of the belt, and when you put a cartridge in there that locks the two pieces together. However, once you empty the belt up to this point, the front end of it, the first half of it, will just fall off. So you don't have a hundred round continuous belt that's going to end up hanging out the end of the gun by the time you're almost done shooting. This is a this belt was largely developed from the German MG34 slash MG42 belts. Now to actually hold this belt on the gun, that's where we have this sort of belt carrier drum. It's just hollow inside. It has no spring, it has no feed mechanism at all. You simply take your belt and you wind it up and put it inside this drum to keep it protected from dirt and such. Uh, these are, by the way, fairly rattly, they're relatively heavy when they're fully loaded, uh, but they do protect the, the belts and the ammunition. Uh, uh, once you close the lid we have a very simple latch right there, that's going to 
keep it closed. There is a spring-loaded cover plate right here, and when you're feeding the gun you pull the belt out this, and that protects it as much as possible while still allowing the belt to come out. The handle here is just for carrying the thing around. So this is how the, the ammunition is actually carried. Now we also have two different versions, or two different styles, of RPD belts that are out there. So you saw this, the original, the original Russian version, and what the thing that makes this distinctive is at the back is sort of a, a little folded divot that sits in the rim of, in the extractor groove of the cartridge, like this. And this is how the, the German MG3442 belts work. However, when Hungary started using the RPD, they didn't make it, but they did use it, uh, they found that this was not that difficult to accidentally bump cartridges out of alignment in. And if you get the rim either forward or backward to that tab, it will cause a stoppage in the gun. So the Hungarians developed their own version of the belt, which is essentially the same, except it has a flat tab that goes all the way behind the cartridge. And this is a much more secure way to, well not much more, this is a more secure way to hold the belt. It should also be pointed out this makes the belt substantially more of a pain in the butt to load. There were no belt loading machines for these. Um, and with this style you can just push the cartridge in from the back. With this style you have to kind of snap it in. Um, I should say these are push through style of belts, so uh, when the cartridge feeds into the gun it just gets pushed straight out of the link and into the chamber. So the Hungarians did this version of the belt um, in 50 round segments, like this one. The Chinese would go ahead and copy this style of the belt, but they actually made it in 25 round segments. Uh, with a Chinese belt you can link together more than 100 rounds should you want to. The Russian and Hungarian styles uh, there's just a, a first half and a second half, and you can't add extra pieces at the end. So those are the different variations of RPD belt that are out there, and now let's look at the gun. In order to actually mount the drum what you do is take the drum and you take uh, sort of the open end of these tabs and you slide it onto this right here. So that goes on there. It slides all the way in, and you'll notice that there are little extended tabs at the end of that bracket to prevent it from going too far. Then you take this locking tab and flip it down, and it prevents the, the drum from coming off the back. And that, that secures the drum in place. And then you can open up this, pull the end of the loaded belt out, and run it right up into the feedway. You will generally find the original markings on the top cover here. So this is a Chinese made example, there were several different countries that made these, we'll touch on that in a minute. This was made at Factory 36. This is a Type 56. The Chinese adopted several Russian guns uh, all in the same year and named them all Type 56, which it's hard to criticize them too much, the US has a whole lot of M1s and M2s of various things. At any rate, this is a Type 56 light machine gun. And there we have a serial number. The Chinese used these for the Chinese military as well as exporting them. Um, I'd like to call out Miles Vining over at SELA Report uh, for actually finally finding and photographing evidence of a Chinese uh, Type 23, or sorry, M23, uh, basically a sanitized commercial export version of the RPD that had long been hypothesized, but I hadn't ever been able to find a picture of one, and Miles found one in China. So um, they made these for their own military as well as for export, both uh, marked as what they are and also for sort of sanitized clean export, so to speak. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the markings that we have on the gun. You'll see some others on this later, and they are uh, US importer manufacturer markings because this is a post sample machine gun in the US. Now we have a club foot style of buttstock. This is the stock that would eventually be adopted, the style that would be used on the RPK as well, um, and it's very similar to the stock that was used on the RP on the DP guns. So the idea is your support hand can come back here and support the back end of the gun. There is a rotating trap door in the stock. There we go. We pop that latch, you can rotate this. Uh, the recoil spring for the gun is here and can be removed, and then typically you would have a cleaning kit, a self-contained cleaning kit in here. This one has some cleaning rod segments, but that's all. And then it snaps back in place. Good storage. 
There is a simple manual safety lever here on the side. This is in the fire position with the red arrow exposed. That is the safe position. Note that the markings here change depending on what nationality the gun is. There is no semi-auto selector. The RPD is either on safe or on full auto, nothing else. There were ultimately four or five different patterns of RPDs that were made. The Soviets made a number of uh, iterative improvements in the gun. One of them is in the charging handle. So the early Soviet guns have a fixed reciprocating charging handle, kind of shaped like this. Uh, one of the updates they did to it was to make the handle itself foldable and to make it non-reciprocating. So we can lock the gun, lock the bolt to the rear, and then you push the charging handle forward, fold it up, and it's nicely out of the way while you're shooting. We have dust covers on several of the openings, basically all of the openings. So this is where the belt comes out. Um, this gun ejects out the bottom. Uh, this, so this is the hanger bracket for the belt carrying uh, drum, which I'll show you in a moment. The gun ejects downward here and cartridges basically bounce off of this plate and away from the gun. So we have a folding dust cover for the belt exit. This is also something that was added. The original Russian guns did not have these dust covers on them. On the opposite side we have the feed side. Note that this is sized for a 7.62x39. The Soviet guns will have a dust cover here. The Chinese have an interesting design where they actually take the whole drum bracket and use it as the dust cover for the feedway. So this is a, a a system or a style of dust cover that's unique to the Chinese guns. Um, it's held in that position by spring tension. When you need to actually use the gun you can just pop that out and then this spring catch down there locks into the receiver and then that's in position ready to mount a drum. Continuing forward we have the front handguard which is really kind of small. This wasn't really designed to be fired uh, from the shoulder. It can be fired from the hip, and that's really what the, the front handguard is for, is, is firing from the hip. Uh, when you're shooting this in its proper bipod mounted position, you don't have a hand up here anyway. You've got your hand on the buttstock. And then the front end of the gun we have a couple things. Obviously we have our front sight block, we have our gas block which is adjustable, and we have a bipod. The bipod squeeze the legs together and it will fold out into this vertical position. Um, it does have a little bit of pivot. Let's see if we can. There we go. It does have some pivot to it like that, um, but no no movement in any other direction. The gas regulator here has three positions: numbered one, two, and three. It is currently set in the number one position, which is the smallest aperture. So uh, as the gun gets dirty or conditions get poor you could move this up to two or three to give the gun more gas and improve its, its rate of fire and its reliability, basically. The way you would change the position is to literally unscrew this nut, rotate this, lift this up, rotate it to a different position, put it back in, and tighten the nut back down. So it's not the greatest system, not super easy to do, especially once the gun has gotten hot. Um, there are tools in your tool kit to do this, but Still kind of a tricky operation, best done when the gun's cool. Really the best option is keep the gun clean and well serviced so that you can just use it in the number one position all the time. Last but not least we have the top cover. We have a spring loaded latch back here. Push that forward and you can lift the top cover up. It gets to this point and it is held in place by a spring. So it doesn't go up higher, but it also doesn't fall on you. And that allows you to inspect the inside of the gun. You can see we have a roller here. Um, there's actually a second roller down inside. That is also an improvement that was made on the Chinese guns and the last end of the Soviet production guns. We'll get to that when we take this apart in just a moment. The feed tray here is really quite simple. We have a little finger right there. When you load a belt in, this tab at the front of the belt lifts up and onto that lip just like so. And that holds the belt in place while the cartridge is popped down, well forward and down out of the belt. And then the belt is going to cycle through the gun like so. The feed mechanism in the top cover is very similar to the German system, also very similar to the M60 system. 
that roller on the bolt carrier uh, runs in this track, and it causes the feed pawls to cycle side to side and pull cartridges in. So nothing really unique up here. To disassemble the gun we're going to punch this pin through, and that will allow us to take off the buttstock and fire control group. Alright, that pin is captive. So we get it to that point. We can slide the back end of the gun off. This is so all the Degtrev guns are really quite similar internally. Um, we've got this one, you've got the DP27 that has this exact same architecture, and then you've got the, uh, the uh, DS39, very rare guns, but basically built largely the same way. So this has our trigger, sorry that it is filthy and disgusting inside because this has not been cleaned in a long time. Um, anyway, that's our trigger. Pull the trigger down, sear drops, which means just the bolt's going to reciprocate back and forth, firing until you put the let the trigger back up. Uh, this rod, by the way, is connected to the recoil spring, which you already saw in the buttstock, uh, so that will uh, get pushed back by the bolt carrier when it cycles. Now we can use the charging handle to pop our bolt carrier out. So. Pull this out. This is oh god, this is going to be disgusting. So, what we have here is again, just like the DP27 and the DS39, we have a gas piston at the front, an operating rod. Uh, this is a long stroke gas operated gun, which means that uh, the, the gas piston and the bolt and carrier are connected together and reciprocate uh, together through their full travel. We have our bolt. This, this gun is fundamentally flapper locked. Alright, um, I took a moment there and cleaned some of this up. I think if, if a Red Army Sergeant had discovered a gun in this condition someone would be going to the Gulag for it. But uh, the gun actually, uh, spoiler alert, we do some shooting with, did some shooting with this yesterday which you'll see tomorrow, and it was this filthy inside at the time and it ran flawlessly. So that says something for the re reliability of the Degtrev system. Uh, anyway, like I was getting started to say, this is flapper locked, which means when the bolt is pushed all the way into battery, these two flaps are forced outward, as you can see here, and they lock against a pair of shoulders in the receiver. That's what locks the action. When the gas piston gets pushed backwards when it fires, these two wedges come back, and right at this point are able to retract back inside the bolt, and then the whole thing can reciprocate back, uh, extracting the empty cartridge. So we have a flat surface on the front of this wedge right there. This fires from an open bolt, so as soon as you pull the trigger this whole thing is going to move forward. Uh, when the cartridge goes in and the bolt face hits the front of the barrel, then it opens up, it, the bolt moves back relative to the bolt carrier like that, the flaps open up, and at the very end of travel this wedge block is going to hit the firing pin right there, which is going to protrude out the face of the bolt like that, and fire the cartridge. So open bolt firing gun, there's no semi-auto. Um, in fact your sear surface is right there. When this is cycling in the gun, that sear will lock against that shoulder to hold the bolt back ready to fire. Now while we have this open I'll point out this roller right here is a secondary roller that was added to smooth out uh, the cycling of the gun. You'll find these on the Chinese guns and also on the very last pattern of Russian guns. Originally they just had this one roller on the top which operates the top cover. Since we're talking about it I will also point out that the cone here at the gas piston is also an element that changed. On these Chinese guns we have essentially a female gas port and a male gas piston. On the very first Russian pattern ones it was reversed, and you actually had a female gas port here that came out just a little bit, and the end of the piston, a uh, uh, male gas port here, and the end of the piston was a female type that would um, actually lock over the end of the gas port. They fairly quickly changed that around to this system, but the early examples had a relatively short cone here that would only come about that far. That left an opening um, that could allow debris and gunk into the gun, 
So the later patterns uh, lengthened this to effectively uh, prevent dirt from getting into the gas piston. So the RPD would be issued at the squad level, as a squad level machine gun. Um, at this point, we're talking early 1950s, the company level machine gun remained, uh, well another Degtrev, it was the RP-46, which was a Degtrev in 7.62x54, originally the pan magazine gun, but retrofitted to be belt feed. That was the company level gun, and then up higher than that at the battalion level I think, um, the SGM, the Goryanov, was used as a, uh, like a tripod mounted uh, heavy machine gun. This would stay in service uh, with the Soviet Army into the 1960s when it was eventually replaced by the RPK, the idea there being essentially one of logistics, that we can take, now that we've actually figured out how to manufacture, reliably manufacture the AKM with its stamped receiver, we can make a light machine gun version of that and have more than 50% direct parts interchangeability with the infantry rifle, and it makes a lot more sense than having a totally unique separate weapon. People will complain that the RPK doesn't have an interchangeable barrel and is thus you know, not capable of heavy sustained fire, but I think it's important to recognize that that was already an accepted limitation of the RPD, and so it was, they weren't losing anything by switching to the RPKs uh, in, as far as that goes. Uh, in addition to being manufactured by the Soviet Union, these would also be produced by China, obviously this is a Chinese example, um, as well as by Egypt. Um, let's see who else, Egypt, North Korea made them, China made them, Russia made them, and Poland made them. So pretty widespread manufacture. These of course were dispersed across the globe and showed up in a lot of small scale conflicts. They still do, although not so much now as perhaps they used to, uh, largely because they did come out of service relatively early compared to guns like the PKs or the RPKs. So. Um, I'd like to give a big thanks to Woody's Weapons and Siena Arsenal, uh, Siena Armory, sorry, for giving me access to this RPD to take a look at and show to you guys. I've been wanting to get a chance to shoot one of these for quite some time, and I'm happy to say that that is what we're doing tomorrow. We're going to go ahead and take this guy out to the range, put some ammo through it, and see what it's like. I have high hopes. I, on paper this seems like a really good light machine gun, at least to my mind. So stick around tomorrow, we'll find out. Thanks for watching.